Mr. Wesley, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. And I'm glad you got the memo about the shirt. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I guess uh, nothing, nothing but product, uh, product advertising yeah. here. <laughs> exactly. Right. And there were only three suits, right? So that's why you're sure. three. only three. So, and you know, they were all UCLA basketball players. They right. were going to college making extra money. And of course, some of them became very famous afterwards. Yeah. Uh, Bill Lambeer of the Detroit Pistons, who was known as the bad boy of, of, uh, of uh, basketball. He was a slee stack. And in fact, Kathy Coleman, who played Holly and I, wouldn't surprise him in Las Vegas a few months ago. And he didn't know we were coming. And because he's kind of very grouchy. So we went to Vegas. He was coaching uh, the number one women's basketball team. And when we got there, all the girl bas women basketball players had a, a photo and they pull, held it up and it was a slee stack. Right. And Kathy and I came in and he just like, <laughs> and he started smiling. And the owner of the franchise said to me, he said, Wesley, I have never seen Bill Lambeer smile that much. And believe me, it wasn't much of a smile. <laughs> yeah. no, it, it's funny because I used to work at uh, ESPN and so did he before he started coaching. So I knew him a, a little bit. So I, the first time I ran into him, I didn't want to bring it up, you know. So, hey, you know, hey, Bill, just, you know, basically small, you know, small talk, you know, talk. And then eventually the next time I saw him, I, I spoke to him about it. He's like, yeah, I really didn't do much. I kind of just hissed and kind of went like this a little <laughs> bit. But it was, it, he's like, for an 18 year old, good money. You know, I, I needed the money. So it was, it, it was good. But yeah, like you said, you're not getting much out of a smile out of him. You know? <laughs> no, but he, he was great. He, you know, yeah. he had the photographers there. And it, I mean, listen, it was, it was a nice come full circle for us. Right. So, you know, we had a ball saying, we, Kathy and I were there signing autographs for the Star Trek convention, which we normally do every year, except for obviously not this year, yeah. COVID. but uh, because our show was written by Star Trek writers. That's right, David, David Gerald. David Gerald was our head writer. He created, he had trouble with triples. He created the triples. Walter Koenig, right. who was the original Chekhov in Star Trek, he was the one that wrote the first Enix script. Okay. The Tom Slee Stack. And, right. uh, you know, DC Fontana, Larry Niven, and... Norman Spinrad, all these amazing sci-fi writers at the beginning of their careers and then became, you know, huge icons. Yeah. yeah. Are you like, we're going on what, 46 years now, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, I, yes. All right. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, are you like, like surprised that we still talk about the show? You know what? It's amazing. I, I talk to Kathy all the time, played Holly. Right. We just talked yesterday and we just find it extraordinary that that after 46 years, we still have a fan base and it, it actually is growing. Younger kids are starting to watch the show. It's like sometimes it's on MeTV or PBS or whatever, the show, you know, they start to show it. But it's held up. The, the science fiction, the sci-fi effects, of course, we didn't have CGI back then. Right. So it looks hokey now, but at the time it was state of the art. Right. Yeah. But it was the scripts. There's some incredible sci-fi because of David Gerald. I mean, you're talking, I mean, this was a Saturday morning show for kids. You know, it wasn't a cartoon. And it was, you know, talking about time doorways and matrices and doppelgangers. And, and it was, you know, an ex sort of extraordinary, you know, thing for, for kids. And we have, uh, we'll be signing autographs or whatever at these conventions. And we'll have people come up to our table. And it's extraordinary. We, that they changed their lives. They're, they began their careers because of Land of the Lost. For instance, two guys came up to us in Los Angeles that were showing. They said, listen, we used to watch you in Iraq. We thought you spoke Farsi okay, because right. we were dubbed in Farsi. He said, my brother and I became two of the heads of JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab. Okay. He said, because of Land of the Lost, we got interested in science fiction and science. Yeah. And so they, and they gave Kathy and I a private tour of JPL. But we've had a lot of our people that became archaeologists and, and uh, you know, scientists. And they'll come to our table and say, listen, it was because as a little kid with my bowl of cereal, I watched Land of the Lost. Yeah. I wonder how they dub uh, Bakumi in Farsi. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and that language, you know, that was amazing. That, you know, the, the Pakuni that Chaka spoke in, in Ta and Sa, his mom and dad, uh, you know, that was a real language that was created at UCLA. Right. Uh, by Froman, and she created this language, and it's, you know, there's a dictionary out. So it wasn't just, and, and you know what was amazing about, about Phil Paley? Phil Paley played Chaka. He was, he was, I think, nine years old. Right. He was the youngest black belt in karate. Okay. And he got cast because he was on the Tonight Show. His coach was Chuck Norris for karate. Yeah. 
So there's a there's a thing you can watch on YouTube. It's hysterical. Where Phil, who's like you know th three feet high, flips Johnny Carson onto the floor, you right. know, and Johnny, of course, plays it for all it's worth. Yeah. And and the cross saw him, and they said, "That's that's our monkey boy." <laughs> but but you know, there'll be episodes where Phil, as a little kid, is speaking total pakuni. I mean, almost the entire episode, and it wasn't something he just got to make up gibber gibberish. He yeah. He had to actually learn the, the language, which was amazing. Right. And I, I guess you can say, you know, Pakuni and Klingon had their own dictionary and other own language. Exactly. I was gonna, yeah, it was uh, Okanza Bisasa, Big Magic. Right. Mira, which was Will. Ari, which was Holly. Right. And was, when did he really start speaking English? Was that like more towards like the third season? He, he, by the third season, he learned English. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> it was our jumping the shark season. <laughs> Yeah, there was so much to it, yeah, in, in, in a second. But, um, like, I, 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 we'll, we'll stay with Land of the Lost first because I'll get to the other stuff in, in, in a second. But um, you mentioned, like, the Star Trek, you know, and, like, the budgets were small in the show, but compare, you know, compared to Star Trek also, which seemed pretty hokey, too. Right. And, you know, and that was, you know, that, sh that show blew up, you know, as much as Land of the Lost. But, of course, when I watched, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. Yeah, me so when, when when I watched Star Trek, you know, I, it didn't look hokey back then. It looked, no, of course not. It right. was, I mean, I was blown away. I mean, I couldn't believe, you know, the science fiction of it. Right. And, and how fortunate that, that my, you know, I was in a show that, that, that crossed paths with the Star Trek people. And Mike Westmoon, right. who's a makeup artist, who did our makeup, created uh, the Slee Stack. Right. Uh, he, d he did a lot of the Star Trek characters, the original Star Trek. And, of course, he has the series on now called Face Off. Right, yeah. No, and we see oh we see we see him at the Star Trek convention every year. He and his son and, and daughter Kimberly. Um, but my favorite is Walter Koenig at the Star Trek convention. So Walter Koenig created it, right? The talking suits there. Yeah. So every time he comes to our table at the Star Trek convention, he's got his hat on and he's shuffling along. And goes, ah, those damn cross! I should have gotten residuals. I should have gotten residuals. <laughs> Uh, uh. he's a great guy yeah god bless him because he does those star trek fan movies as well oh my gosh yeah Ari and them and you know it's it's great after all these years you, know, you have a character who's brought in because he looked like davy jones yeah the, uh, the yeah and pretty much but i i watched um unfortunately i didn't watch it when i was born a year after it show debuted so i didn't watch it during its original run i in the mid 80s when it was on you know the second you know Marty Croft, uh, like the Avengers. Superstars, yes. Super, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. the Croft superstars. Yeah, exactly. And they brought it in. That's when I was immediately hooked yeah. with the show. Um, and yeah, like, I watch it on YouTube a lot, and it's uh, it, story's great. I mean, you know, it's I will bring it up to my son. I have another, you know, infant, so I'm gonna kind of get him into it, and as well as Dragon Tales. But yeah, it, it, the show crosses generations. And it's, uh, well, you know, and also, one of the reasons I think it holds up, and we're told this by people that watched it, is that it was about a, it was a drama. Right. It was a family, a broke, I mean, a family, that we lost our mom. Yeah. You know, it was a one parent, it was our dad, Marshall, uh, Rick Marshall, and, and Holly and Will. And it was, at the end of the day, it was a family surviving together. And we have people come up to our table. We, it's extraordinary experiences. Like um, there's one African-American girl that came up to our table and she said, listen, I lived in Compton when I was a little kid. It was one of the roughest places at the time. She said, we weren't allowed to play outside. We had to play inside because, the, and she said, we would play Land of the Lost all weekend. She was crying. And another guy came up to us at one table and said, um, listen, in the third season, my mom and dad were breaking up. And I was, he said, I was devastated. I couldn't stop crying. I, I, I didn't know if my family was going to survive. I was devastated. And I watched in the third season, we lost our dad. Our, our uncle came in. Yeah. And he said, I saw how you guys survived as a family. He says, I know this may sound a little silly and stuff, but it helped me get through the divorce of my parents. And he's this, this guy, this wonderful man, he's in his 50s, was just sobbing at the table. So it, it's amazing how it, it pulled the strings because it wasn't hokey. And that's, of course, the Will Ferrell movie, <laughs> which is the elephant in the room yeah. of Land of the Lost, which, uh, by the way, Sid Marty Croft at Comic-Con said, all right, we apologize for, <laughs> for that. But the problem with the Land of the Lost movie with, with Will Ferrell is it was like Abbott and Costello. You know, it didn't have a heart. It wasn't about a family. It, it took a different direction. Right, and it's a shame because you look at, say, like um, Lost in Space when they had, you know, their movie, which what was it was pretty good, and then they had a Netflix show remake, which was really good. Yes, it went in that direction rather than kind of like you know, ham it up. 
Well, and the cross keep and cross announced at Comic Con like the, 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 there's another Land of the Lost series in development, right? Based on the original. So we'll, I mean, I, I we'll see if it ever happens or not. Yeah. I, I I talked to Sid Croft every once in a while. He called me like last week. I mean, I love Sid. Sid's uh, I think ninety two. Oh, wow. Well, I, I take it back. I don't talk to Sid. To I Sid. listen to Sid. <laughs> right. Sid will call, and I will listen for an hour gladly. He tells because he just nonstop. He does. He doesn't ask you a question. He just starts talking, talking. But he tells you when Michael Jackson was in his house, and this happened, and was in the circus, and and he will go on with all the stories and. They're the most fascinating things. And I, I'm sitting there on the phone, I'm thinking, how lucky am I that the legend of Sid and Marty Croft just called me, you know? And, and I'm sitting here just listening, and he's talking to me and telling me how much he loves me and, you know, all these sort of things. And, and I thought, what an honor. I mean, just to, to have been, like, brushed. And I tell him, you know, the fact that I got to brush against your legend is an amazing experience. Right, exactly. And I mean, all the stuff they did, I mean, Land of Lost, and, I mean, Puffin stuff, Lidsville, right. you know, incredible. Yeah. The Donnie yeah. Marie show, for gosh sake. Yeah. Paul Lynch show, I mean, they, you know, everything, so. Yeah, and then I know um, Deidre Hall, who had Electric Woman and Banner Girl, you helped her with- uh, I did! Uh, so I was, on, I was on Days of Our Lives at the same time. I played Mike Horton for almost a decade. And Deidre Hall, so we're filming Land of the Lost. I'm on the set, I'm all in my little outfit, you know, my blue shirt. And, and Deidre Hall comes over. She said, listen, my name's Deidre Hall. I'm on another Sid and Marty Cross show, uh, Dining Girl and, and uh, uh, Electro, Electro, Dining Girl, Electro Woman. Yeah. And she said, listen, I've got an audition for Days of Our Lives. Because I was doing Days of Our Lives in the morning and Land of the Lost in the afternoon. So I said, I know what they're looking for. I said, let me help you. I know this. So we got the script. We worked on the script and stuff. Well, she got the part. Not... Not to say I got her the part because she's very talented and right. she's still on the show. Yeah. And, and she's the granddam now after all these years since she got on in the early 70s. And, um, you know, but so I, so I was lucky because I had two NBC shows. So in the morning, I'm doing Days of Our Lives and I'm crying that my girlfriend is leaving me and breaking my heart and the mafia is after me. And I, a wagon fell on my chest and crushed it. And I found out my father wasn't my father because he's really my uncle because my uncle and my father had a relationship, idiot. And in the afternoon, I run over to go to uh, General Services Studios and I'm running for dinos from dinosaurs going, run Holly, run, there's the dinosaur. So my, it's very schizophrenic. Right now, I'm sure, yeah. I, literally before this interview, my wife was just watching an episode of Days of Our Lives because she, she's obsessed. So I just came up and, you know, watched because she's, I don't watch it literally, but you know, like, yeah. things and like, I'll sit down and I'll ask questions. She's like, just watch it with me. I'm like, no, 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 I just want to know what's going on. <laughs> you know, and, I'll, and then I'll sit down. and We actually, on Days of Our Lives, we had one, when I was on, one day on, lasted a year of filming. <laughs> it started in the early morning and it went for almost a year. Right. And the girls hated it. First of all, they couldn't change their hair. <laughs> and they'd do the same look, the same color, the whole thing. And uh, it went on and on. I mean, it was, it was amazing, you know. And, and they were like my family. And, I, you know, and, and I'm still really close to uh, several of them. Bill and Susan, right. Susan Seaforth and Bill Hayes and, yeah. you know, a, a bunch of them. So um, I, they were very much my family. I kind of sort of grew up there. My, my, I spent my 20s on Days of Our Lives. What was like the biggest difference between filming like Lena Lost, filming like they just not like, you know, the sets or anything, just like, you know, learning the script and just, you know, your own personal experience. Well, Days of Our Lives, you know, it was every day. I wasn't on every day, but I mean, some days, and the first year I was on was only a half an hour, then went to an hour. So I'm filming an hour show in the morning, but NBC let me do all my scenes up front because I was on both series. So the other ca the cast members hated me for three years because I got to go in, film my scenes and leave and go to the other set, that, you know, in Hollywood because we're in NBC Burbank. And uh, so some days, you know, I mean, I would get the next night, I'd get my script and it would be like 30 pages of dialogue. It was like, oh, yeah. okay, I had to learn that that night. And then I had to learn the script for Land of the Lost because we shot, Land of the Lost, you know, the budget was so cheap back then. We shot an episode in two and a half days. Okay. So we shot two episodes a week. And that was quick. I mean, it was just, you know, racing through the jungles and the pylons and, you know, yeah. you know running from pterodactyls. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. How much of it, like, acting that there was actually a dinosaur going to eat you? How long did that take you to actually perfect that? 
Well, we really had real dinosaurs. Um, okay. It was the parking lot was a mess because they stepped on cars. And it was not. It was not easy. The guy with the shovel. It was horrible. <laughs> no. Well, we had back in the day. We had. It was called. Uh, it was uh, blue screen. Right. It's now green screen. Everybody knows what that is now. But it was state of the art. It had never been done before. And we had an entire sound stage. And they're huge. You know, they're like they're like airport anchors. And, airline. and the whole wall was painted blue, the floor was blue. So we got on it and they had filmed the, the, the dinosaurs like Grumpy and stuff. They were all stop frame animation. It took them like eight hours to do a minute worth of movement for dinosaurs. Right. So it was the first time in history of television that they melded film with video. So we had a monitor sitting there. You could see the, 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 the lost city and the Grumpy and stuff. And then they would, sh we'd stand on the blue screen, the blue area, and they would shrink us down to fit, to be proportionate in the scene with the dinosaur. And then they'd say, okay, look at that light. And that's where Grumpy's head is. And that was one of the big, you know, lights. Run this way and scream. And it was like, ah, no. so. <laughs> How, um, I know they, uh, you and uh, Kathy filmed a scene for the uh, remake, for the, or the movie, I should say. And I guess it's oh, kind of Right, yeah. Oh. Um, what was totally. your reaction, like just watching the movie at first? So I went to the premiere. Okay. Kathy didn't go. Phil, Phil went with me. Right. And we, it was at, at Man's Chinese, Brahmin's Chinese, which was fabulous. And all the photographers, it's going to be this big, you know, multi. Yeah. We spent $200 million at Universal on this. $100 million to film it and $100 million on promotion. It's like uh, Subway sandwiches and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So I'm sitting in, in, and I've never seen the movie. And... I'm sitting <laughs> watching the movie and I couldn't believe what I was watching. It was, it was no heart, no soul. It was not land lost. And Holly, and this is not the daughter of Marshall, it's his love interest. Yeah. So there's, it's quiet in the theater. <laughs> I'm sitting there and there's a scene in the Will Ferrell version where Will kisses Holly. And I go, ah! like that. It caught me by surprise that everybody's looking around. I literally visceral because I it was I was like, uh, no, no. So at the end, they have this party um, upstairs. It was um, Highland and and, and uh, Hollywood Boulevard, and at the at the theater and upstairs was the big banquet with catered and all these celebrities and everybody's you know running around Will Ferrell and uh, everybody and ice sculptures with dinosaurs and stuff and projections of lights and land of the law. I mean, so Phil and I played shocker. We're standing in the back and I go, Phil, look around. Just, just look around a second. This party costs more than all three seasons of land of the lost. And it did. Right. That, that ice sculpture is probably more than one episode. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. But did anyone like at that party, like come up to you guys and like want to talk about the show? Or sure. Well, everybody was hobnobbing back then. Will Ferrell was terrific, by the way. I mean, listen, he could, he was a huge fan. You know, he played, he, one, one of those characters he played in another movie was Marshall Willenhall. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and but Danny, Danny Friel, uh, I went to the, uh, the set at Universal, which was extraordinary. I mean, the yeah. jungles, and the, I mean, it was all life size. Yeah. And, and Danny Friel played, played Will in, in the movie. And so he came over to me and, uh, I, I presented like pretending like I was passing a torch to him and he grabbed the torch, you know. But when I first met Will Farrell, he he came running and we saw him at Universal and they were filming and he ran over to me and said, Wesley, Wesley, I sang the theme song yesterday. Because I think I sang the original right. theme song yeah. on the series and, and the closing theme song. So I mean could not have been sweeter and, and Anna Friel was terrific and yeah. it just didn't work. No. Was his version of the theme song better than J. 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 I'm going to tell you, Jake Gyllenhaal and Bubble Boy for Disney, fabulous. I think I got a dollar seventy-five the other day from Disney. Right. So, because uh, Jake plays, Jake pretends he's me in a couple of scenes, but and he, but he rocked because the, the closing theme song to Land of the Lost, I love it. Right. And, he, and in the opening, he's rocking it out. You know, when I look all around, I can't believe the things I found. Now I need to find my way. I'm lost. I'm lost. Find me living in the land of the lost, 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 living in the land of the lost. <laughs> and he, you know, it, he's terrific in it. Right. And, and it's amazing. You, you can go on YouTube and um, 
uh, Tenacious D, okay. you know that band with the uh, Jack Black's band? They do a cover of the opening and closing theme song to Land of the Lost, and they rock it. It's right. fabulous. Oh, that's great. When, when did you find out that there was nothing in the movie Bubble Boy? Um, I think I got a thing from the, the union contacted me. They were going to use clips of me. Right. Okay. And uh, so, and then I went and watched the movie, and I loved it. It's like this cult film, and right. you know, and I love it. He's they're riding dinosaurs, and it's nice. I, I I'd like to meet him one day and talk about it. Jay. Yeah. yeah, he's gotten a lot bigger since then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What a career. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, obviously, from season two to three lost your father and then got uncle uncle jack did how much did you know about like spencer's like you know whole like, dispute with the company? i didn't really know anything and, and i just found out you know that oh by the way yeah. spencer's not doing it anymore and, and uh ron harper who who was famous for uh planet of the apes the right. tv series yeah and his wife was on days of our lives with me at the same time right. so i was like oh, okay this is it's great. Playing Sally, I think the character was Sally. Uh, it was it was strange, and we miss Spencer a lot. I mean, Spencer calls me now. I mean, we're still friends. Spencer's in his eighties, living up in uh, Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Right. He's on a beautiful estate. He doesn't need to act or work at all anymore. Right. But he'll call me. He'll call me. He'll go, Wesley, well, this is your papa calling. <laughs> And we'll just laugh and giggle, and he calls he calls Phil Paley, Chuck, and, and Kathy Coleman, Holly, the same. And we we he calls them on the phone, and we'll we'll and he just he says the same thing over and over again. And we just laugh. Right. And it's like we're all still very very close. Kathy is like my sister, and I talk to her all the time. That's great. And then obviously with the whole uh, pandemic, uh, I'm sure you guys had a bunch of uh, conventions, right? Had to be Tom, we just got uh, uh, Chiller just got canceled, and. We're supposed to go to the Star Trek convention that got canceled. Uh, you know, and yeah, everybody, of course, everybody. Yeah. it makes no sense. I don't know, you know, there won't be a convention, I don't think, until there's a vaccine, until we're all safe and we can, you know, we can interact again because that's what the conventions are all about. It's not just getting an autograph, it's about being together, hugging and, you know, yeah. going out and, and singing together. Right. And, I, and I've been to a few like different cities and they get crowded too. So you can't social distance in any of these. No, and that, yeah, it's it defe it's like the theater. It, it defeats the purpose of can't get yeah. together. I know, it's a shame, uh, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, yeah, it's all of us. All, and I was telling you, I have a house in Mexico. I spend half the year in Puerto Vallarta and half the year in Palm Springs. Yeah. And uh, it's devastating in Mexico right now. Yeah, that's true. Well, hopefully, uh, well, they just announced that, you know, they're working on a vaccine with Pfizer and hopefully. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. hoping, I'm hoping. Yeah, you know. exactly. My wife's a school teacher, so she had to teach at home through like the last year. They say they're going back in September, but there's really no, it's, it's basically, you're going back, but we don't know any you know, yeah. rules. Or anything like that. I lectured at schools uh, and I had a bunch of lectures lined up. Right. I teach kids how to write books. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, they all got canceled. I had to cancel one myself because when it just started the pandemic, I called the principal. I said, look, the writing on the wall is just not good. I, I think we let's let's do this next year. Yeah. Have you done any like the virtual like conventions yet? No, uh, no, I, I, you know, I, yeah, it's not the same. The, no, because you know the fun that we like is you know is is being with the, with people that watch the show or, uh, but also for us going to these conventions, not you know not just as as somebody who's done a TV series or two, but we get to go with fans. And see you know, them. I get to go play with my my you know like the Leave It to Beaver guys that I watched as a kid. You know, the Lost in Space. You know, Billy Mooney and and all and Angela uh, Cartwright and all those people that I was when I was a kid. I was huge fan and yeah. for me to be go have breakfast with them you know it's like you know, go i mean going out to breakfast with todd bridges is just hysterical sure. i'm just telling you i mean yeah. I, I i was at a convention recently and um sam jones who played uh or sam yeah flash gordon and i knew sam before he had a job right he used to I'd come out i had a little horse ranch out, out in canyon country california back in the day and sam used to come out and hang out there you know right. and bring all these these beautiful girls and stuff like that. And I hadn't seen, I hadn't seen Sam in a couple of decades. 
And we just did the show together. And I go, hello, Sam. He goes, Leslie. <laughs> I said, I got some secrets to tell. He goes, oh, no, no. Like, right. You know, it's, yeah. it's, nice, it's, it's nice to reconnect with a lot of people that, that you know, I, I'm huge fans of. Yeah. I had uh, Michael Gray on last year, right, right when uh, Shazam opened up the movie. Yes. So he started, you know, redoing all these conventions as well. So I was really happy for him that, you know, he's kind of brought back into the spot. And, and Michael and I knew each other because we were, we were, quote, teen idols at the same time. We were in the same publication because Michael was on the cover of everything. Yeah. Uh, but we, we were friends too uh, off. Back in the day, it was interesting because it was a smaller world back then. And all the guys that were on the covers of, of like Tiger Bean and 16 Magazine, yeah. um, the DeFrancos and, you know, yeah. uh, the monkeys. Right. We kind of all, we all knew each other. We'd go to the same parties. We would, you know, hang out. So I knew Michael Gray really well. And, so I just reconnected with Michael in Sacramento later. So. Yeah, that's great. And plus Facebook is great because it brings together. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. And like you, before you even acted, you were part of a, a musical group, right? In, in Motown. I was. I was the, I was recording for Motown of all things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you notice that didn't go anywhere. But Mike Curb was producing us. And Mike Curb uh, had the Mike Curb, Curb congregation. He also became the, um, the, the, uh, uh, California uh, vice, what do you call it? Governor. Uh, yeah. oh, Lieutenant Governor, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Governor, that's it. But there were four guys and we were singing and stuff like that. Um, and it was fun. I mean, you know, it, yeah. my first, I, I, got a, my, I got my first TV series when I moved from New York. I'd been working at, at the American Shakespeare Festival at Stratford and came, you know, thought, well, I, I heard I could get an apartment, a house for the same thing I was paying for rent in New York City. It was like 200 bucks back then. <laughs> I got a house in, in Hollywood and, and I went on an open call and got my first TV series within a week and um, called The Organic Vegetables. Mm -hmm. It was produced by the guys that produced The Monkey. So I became the lead singing drummer and we first shooting them. It was Kay Ballard who was the star of it and from the mothers in law. And mm -hmm. uh, then there was Rice Track. It, it never made on the air. So it, it, it faded and fast. Kay, if, you, if you're fans of Kay Ballard, I know. It's, you know, I love Kay. She passed away last year. Right. But I never met her because we never filmed together. So I go to a party here in Palm Springs 10, 12 years, 15 years ago. And, and she's at the party. And I go, excuse me, Miss Ballard, you don't know me, but you've been on my resume for 30 years. <laughs> and we became dear friends. That's so, right. yeah. And I guess you were really close to replacing David Cassidy? On the, on the, uh, yeah, D D I was going to play, replace David for ABC. They, David had decided to leave. Uh, he said, okay, I'm done, I'm done with the Partridge family. So they didn't want to give up the show. So the idea was they were looking for somebody to cast as David's next door neighbor, become his best friend, had a single dad. David goes off to college. I become the lead singer of the Partridge family because David and Shirley, they, they hook up. My, I mean, my, the guy played my dad would hook up right. and we'd be part of the family. So I went with Bobby Sherman, uh, who's another teen idol. So I go to Bobby's house and record a song. I had to sing this song that they'd written for the Partridge Channel. And I recorded it for ABC and uh, Bobby produced it. And then I go and audition for ABC and sing and dance and lip sync and do the whole thing. And I got the part and then David heard that I was going to do it. I don't know if this is all right. Anyway, he decided to stick. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't want to give up his his throne, so uh, it never happened. That 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 storyline never happened. And then the show got canceled, right? Anyway, got canceled right after that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. That, that's a yeah. I had a, I had a lot of uh, almost. I was uh, cast as Gopher in Love Boat. Okay. And, and, to, and they did two pilots. I was doing the second one, and it was for ABC. I was on Days of Our Lives. Okay. You know, NBC and they NBC and ABC made up and said, okay, you can do both shows. Wow. So I'm I'm getting packed up to go catch the boat, film whatever the first thing is, the whatever it's going to be, and and NBC pulls out, says no, we we don't want to, no no, we, you can't go, you can't go. So I have I have a lot of almost yeah, right. And then, <laughs> I could have been a contender. Yeah, and then one more, the Australian Tonight Show, right? I guess you were going to host that too. I was I was offered the Tonight Show to host the Tonight Show in in Australia, out right. of Melbourne, and it was. I went there because Days of Our Lives was a huge hit in Australia back in the 80s. And I went there on my own. I ended up doing a lot of talk shows. And they liked me. They offered me a bunch of shows. They asked me to host Family Feud. 
Okay. Now, a family feud in the 80s in Australia was really interesting. <laughs> there was a guy, he had his shirt open down to here with lots of gold chains. It was the host yeah. at the time. And it, it was like, there were only four to a family, not five. Okay. I figured, well, they didn't have enough people in Australia. <laughs> and so, and, and they wanted an American to host it because the, their big prize was like, you've won a couch. It was really like that. But so they'd go, uh, like Family Feud, they'd go, uh, uh, you know, they'd be answer 100, we've surveyed 100 people, all day, and somebody would go, uh, a mouse. Is it a mouse? Oh, it is a mouse. Yes, it is a mouse. It was that kind of excitement. They said, Leslie, can you make, I said, I said, man, I don't want to host this show. So they offered me the Tonight Show. It's going to be three nights a week out of Melbourne. Right. And, and um, again, so, the government decided that they didn't want an American to host a show in Australia at the time. They were using this. Yes. And uh, so in the, in the paper in Melbourne, it was, will Wesley make it was the headline. And Wesley did not make it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you did end up hosting a game show, which I, I loved. I got a Nickelodeon maybe six months before Finders Keepers came on. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely love, love the show. Um, what made me crack up was your outfits, you know, the sweaters you had. I, I don't know, maybe you, Mark Summer, I don't know if it was like a directive from Nickelodeon. They had to wear these funky, you know, shirts. It was, yeah. and it was a show called Finders Keepers. Right. And uh, we filmed in Philadelphia because it was a two-story set with, and the right. kids wanted the right to go trash a room. Yeah. And, and all the wardrobe was provided by them, but our sponsor was Converse Shoes. Oh. So every episode I had to wear a different pair of Converse. And back in the 80s, Converse had glow in the dark zebra go in the dark you know tiger and blues and yellows yeah. and so i had more unworn converse shoes that i hauled back to los angeles right. after i did we did a shot twice yeah. and um so all of my friends who had small feet like me <laughs> were so happy because right. i was giving out converse shoes yeah and that show was fantastic because I was jealous. I would have loved just to trash a room like that and not oh. you're responsible to clean it up. I mean, uh, do you know it, it, it's interesting because uh, there were young, there were kids playing. You know, we had school come in bus. We shot five five shows a day, uh, three in the morning, two in the afternoon, and, and different kids on buses. And I was at a convention signing autographs. And this kid comes up to me and goes, "Hi, I, I know you don't know me." He right. said, well, "I was on Finders Keepers," and I cheated. <laughs> he said, I watched where you look. And I watched, no, I watched where the camera pointed. They had to find an object in 60 seconds. Right. Yeah. The room. And the camera, he said, I watched where the camera was and watched your eyes. He said, I went and found whatever it was. And, uh, you know, he, it was great to see him again. Right. No, that, that's brilliant. That's, 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 you know, smart. He was smart. He was very smart. He <laughs> Take any, uh, absolutely any chance you can. But then this series got picked up against syndication and then moved to LA, but they replaced Yeah, they, they, I, I, yeah, they asked me. They, they said, we want somebody younger to host the show, is what they told me. Right. So, yes. What are you going to do? Yeah. You know? And the show did not last. No, it didn't. No. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there, was, there was a small happiness about that, but, uh, you know. But, like, the, your version ran reruns for a couple of years on Nickelodeon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I still, I actually got a t-shirt because everybody, all the, all the contestants, either you're the red team or the blue team and you had the fine people for it. I've got a couple of t-shirts hanging in the closet that have never been worn. Oh, that's right, yeah. So how did, um, like, the idea for Dragon Tales come about? Dragon Tales was interesting. I had, was one of the writers and producers on a show called Totally Hidden Video for Fox. Right. Uh, hidden camera, nasty, mean, Mark, uh, it, anyway, it was, it was uh, Mark Pitta was the host. That's right. And the executive producer uh, moved over to Sony Pictures. I left the show though. I went and started a musical in uh, Canada. So, he, and I'd written a book. It's a book called The Red Wings of Christmas. And it's a book, the Disney option for an animated feature. And Jim Cohen was the executive producer uh, with to Sony Pictures that I'd worked with until the video for Fox. He calls me, and because his son's favorite book was The Red Wings of Christmas. And he said, Wesley, I've got these dragon drawings. You know, we found them from Ron Rudiker, who's this, this guy in, um, in Laguna Beach at the Arts Festival. He sells these 
fabulous dragon guards. They didn't look anything like dragon tails. Eventually right. looked like, right. but um, he says, "Can you help me put this together as a show?" So I went over to Sony Pictures and worked on the show and created Zach and Wheezy and a couple of other ones. Um, and we put the show together, and it's so there was a twenty million dollar grant, sixteen million dollar grant that the government was offering. And everybody wanted Muppets, Sesame Street. Everybody was vying for it. I wrote the show in three days with the help of rewriting and stuff. Within a week, we sold the show. Wow. So. Yeah. And it ran for uh, uh, almost a decade on PBS. Right. My, my son's name, my oldest son, Zach. So it's, oh, nice. Yeah. Well, it's spelling, exactly but... easy. Now, originally, it was Snarf and Booger. But uh, PBS said no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So what, what do you what do you have working on now? Anything? Well, I've got I've got a well, thanks to the the virus we're not filming, but I've sold um, a reality show that I've been executive producer. Okay, cool. I can't talk, I can't talk about it yet, but it's oh, wow. it's it's pretty extraordinary. It's very very unique. But All right, cool. That, that's for another day, and and the virus is 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 waned. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to have you back on to talk about it. That'd be that'd be fantastic. Yeah. But uh, a couple more land of loss. Uh, when season three started, and when you get Uncle Jack, you get a last name too. In the <laughs> credits. <laughs> oh my God! The worst. <laughs> I was billed the first two years as a West. Right. And that was the worst decision. It was a manager at the time because I was recording for Motown. I was there. Oh, Wesley, you'll just be a yeah. you know on the cover of Sixteen magazine and Tiger Beat and all that stuff. So let's just do Wesley, like Cher. Right. And of course, it is. Well, it's fun to talk about now. It's separated me from the pack. Yeah. But by this, the third season, I go, uh, I think we need to go put my last name here. You know what I mean? So it's Wesley Your. I... Yeah. <laughs> did they come to you about singing the two theme songs? Or did you like? No, they did. Well, I, I, I think the first episode, was they had somebody else sing it. And then they said, well, Wesley needs to sing it. I mean, he's doing the Teen Idol stuff and, and you know, he's singing and doing all this. So I went into the studio and the guy that produced it was Michael Lloyd. Michael Lloyd is one of the top producers we produced from every major group he, he's produced. Well, he happened to be one of the boys in the boy band. Okay. Motown with me. Right. And I mean, he's quite famous. And so we were one of the four guys. So we went in there and I recorded the theme song and the closing song. And then in the third season, I had to go back into the studio and re-record the theme song because it told a different story. Right. You know, that's what I loved about the theme song, Line of the Lost, is like the old ones, like the Gilligan's Island and things like that. It tells the story, like Marshall, Will, and Holly on a routine expedition that the greatest earthquake ever known. High on the rapids, it struck their tiny raft, ah, plunging down a thousand feet below to the land of the lost. So I went back into the third season and I had to go, uh, Will and Holly Marshall, as the earth beneath them trembled, lost their father through the door of time. Uncle Jack was searching and found the kids at last, looking for a way to escape, escape, escape from the land of the lost. So we had to go tell a new story. Right. And it's a shame now because like shows don't have those theme songs anymore where they tell the story of the show. Yeah. You miss that, you know, because you, like you mentioned Gilgamesh Island, you know, Brady Bunch, you know, like all, all these shows like spoke, you know, you First, my favorite one is, you know, I, I love me. Listen, I have become an addict to me TV now watching every, all the shows I never watched as a kid, you know, and, uh, but uh, we watch the Andy Griffith show, you know, it's, it's just the theme song, just the whistle, right? Right. Yeah. But you know, it has lyrics, yeah. but they decided not to do the lyrics because the whistle works so well. It's great. Yeah. But it's interesting how things, you know, whatever sort of, yeah, what, whatever floats your boat at the time. Yeah. Right. No, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, they just started showing the Flintstones again on me too. Yes. I just been like DVRing that like crazy and watching those because like, that was like one of my favorite cartoons growing up. So. Oh yeah. I, yeah. Listen, some of the shows I never got the chance to see, like Matlock and and you know all those shows. Now I'm watching them and going, oh, these scripts are pretty good. I'm like amazing. So. Yeah, because back then we didn't have like, definitely didn't have DVRs and even VCRs, so you just had to catch it when it was on. Yes, you I'm that. seeing shows that I was in that I never saw before. Right. Yeah. You know, but what's odd about seeing me TV now is because I'm old. <laughs> I'm at the end of, of my journey here. Oh, and, um, and I'm seeing all my people that I've known throughout my, my career at the beginning of their careers. 
especially the people that played my, like Francis Reed played my grandmother, or the people that were in my life, older actors, and seeing it at the beginning there is like in Wagon Train and things like that. And I go, it's extraordinary to see the beginning of their, Mark Tapscott, who was on Days of Our Lives. I saw him in a Western playing a villain the other day. He ended up, I used to produce the, uh, shows for NBC, their, I used to, their Christmas show for all the employees, and Mark was by Santa Claus, <laughs> you know, and just to, to see people that are, you know, like Kenny Lester and, and all these amazing actors and um, and to see how young they were in the beginning, and just, and anyway, it's like home movies for me. Right. Can you, like, sit down and, like, watch your, like, just put in, like, Land of Lost or put in one of your shows. Can you sit down and watch I, your I actually don't. Uh, so I, I've got, got the DVDs here and all that stuff, but I, I don't usually watch it, you know, it's, but some of the episodes, I don't, I, there's a, the, in the third season of Land of the Lost, I started singing. Right. So I had like a, a four string gourd guitar that when I started playing, the orchestration was amazing. Violins and drums. And <laughs> it was Land of the Lost, it was magic. Right. But I, so I'd never heard those songs. You know, I never saw the third season because I was working. And, and I, if you didn't catch it a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock or whenever it aired, you didn't see it. Right. So somebody did a compilation of all the songs recently, me singing. And I, it's the first time I've ever heard me sing those songs. And the songs I used to, I recorded with the, uh, uh, with the Osmonds. Okay. So the Osmonds had a studio in Santa Monica, in California, across from the temple, the Mormon temple. And they had this apartment building and they had, you know, they had they had their sound stage in the studio there, their mixer and everything. And I would go over there and they wrote these little ditties and I would sing, you know, to, to strum my guitar and sing, you know, and you know, a couple of verses and that was it. So it was fun to see it was fun to listen to those and, 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 and reminisce. Right. Because I think the last what was odd can I tell you what was odd about that though with, with the Osmonds? So you go to they, they have, these guys had more money than anything back. This was their the prime of their careers. Right. They owned this apartment house. And I would go in, I'd go into their, their, their apartment and there wouldn't be like a, a light, a, a switch cover. There'd be the, the switch, but the cover was gone. I was going, hey, can't you afford to get a switch cover? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? something's odd about this apartment. Right, or at least like an, an Osmond theme switch cover, you know, I'm sure. Yeah, it's something, I mean, it was, you know, <laughs> they were terrific guys and, you know, and it was nice to work with them. Right. And of course, Sid and Marty Croft were also producing the, the, the Donnie Marie show. Yeah. And he's, he's still going strong. Yeah. You know? Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, they got their star on the Walk of Fame. Uh, I couldn't go. Kathy was, was actually visiting me in Mexico at the time. So um, we sent him a, a little video and stuff. But we, we, if Phil Paley went, played Chaka. Oh, right. So Phil went for the star. And uh, it was quite a ceremony out here. So. That's sorry, I'm mean, really sorry I missed it. Right, yeah. I mean, we have to work on your star. I mean, because you certainly earned it. <laughs> I got a star in Palm Springs on the Walk of Fame, which was, I, I got it, uh, I, I used to uh, produce a lot of fundraiser shows. So the city of Palm Springs, as a tribute, gave me, for I raised a lot of money for different charities. Right. And that was quite a day, I must say. It was extraordinary. Celebrities and, you know, Mary Wilson was there with the Supremes and, you know, Kay Ballard and I mean, a whole bunch of celebrities. Right. And it was quite an emotional thing. And my mom was there. She got to see it. My mom has passed on. But uh, I remember getting my star that day and then, you know, the streets were crowded and, and all that stuff. And she said, people really like you, don't they? <laughs> yes, brother. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Surprise. <laughs> right. no, that's good. Yeah. Do you like ever check on in Days of Our Lives at all or no? Yeah, yeah, every once in a while I'll flip on it and you know, I'll see Suzanne Rogers, yeah. who played my stepmom on Days of Our Lives. For, you know, all these years, she was a rockette back in the day. And just, you know, what's mostly amazing for me is to watch how much we've aged. I mean, look at, you know, since normally if this wasn't the virus, I, this would all be died. Right. But yeah. <laughs> the white has come out. I can't hide it anymore. No, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Was there ever talk about them bringing you back as Mike Horton? Or no? I, I, I never heard them talk about it. I, I, it would be. A, a, I'd love to go back and film another scene. You know, right. that would be nice. It'd be kind of a nice full circle. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I left. Uh, boy, I, I, 
yeah, it, it was, it, it, I miss them. I mean, it was like, it was my family. And um, it, it, especially when I was growing up, I was a kid, you know, I mean, I was, I was just turned 20 and I'm getting on Days of Our Lives. And when I was a kid in Mississippi, a real little kid, my grandmother was a huge Days of Our Lives fan, huge. So I'm a little kid, like five years old, whatever. And she would be ironing and watching Days of Our Lives with those one of those old irons. Yeah. And so every time I would watch, when I got on Days of Our Lives, my grandmother had just passed. She never got to see me on Days of Our Lives. But when I would watch it, I could smell a burnt iron. And so I think she, well, she would have been obviously astonished. Because I'm from this, I'm from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where nobody in my family, we're not, you know, we're not theater oriented. They were all educators and professors and things like that. So this was a world unbeknownst to any of my family. Right. So what made you like become a performer then? You know, I, I, my dad left when I was two. He never came back. And I think I just needed attention. You know, I, I, I was raised with all women and I think I wanted to stand out. And I, I remember at five years old in Hattiesburg, I just go, I'm going to be an actor. Mm -hmm. And I can still remember the silence of the room and the look on their face. I swear I can remember. They were like, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I had the same thing too. My father left when I was really, really young. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's tough, but you know, you obviously, you know, strived, so which is great. Well, you, you think about it and you wonder who you would be. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, if I, my dad had been around and I wonder what my life would have been. It would have certainly taken a different path. Right. You know, my needs would have been different. My ego would have been different. Right. But I re you know, I remember my dad, I, I remember the last day I was sitting on his lap in Hattiesburg, my mother's crying upstairs, my sister's bawling her eyes out at my grandmother's house. And that jerk says to me, he says, take care of your mother. I'm two years old. I remember, I, re I remember very much my first year of life. Right. And, and, and it didn't dawn on me until later the burden he put on me. And I didn't, of course, understand it. Right. Of I took care of my mom or I put her through law school. I gave her a house. I, I, you know, all that stuff in life took really good care of her. I mean, and, and, and willingly, I mean, and, and gratefully so that I was able to, but when you realize that those, that voice stays inside of you and, and directs the rest of your life and sometimes not for the good. Right. So, yeah. As, I, I have no memory. So I no, guess you don't. That's probably better off that way. This way. What happened? Where, 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 where's your dad, Joe? Did he just? He, um, you know, the, he was a Vietnam vet, and he got, you know, seriously injured there, and then took a wrong path and drugs and stuff like that. So my mom basically kicked him out. You know, either the drugs or us. He picked the drugs, and um, yeah, that was it. Uh, he did come back one time. I think it was maybe six or seven. My elementary school was right across the street from my apartment building. I was coming home. I guess he was waiting to see me. I didn't recognize him. I walked right past him. And then I guess that was the last time they even made contact. So, but you know, I was lucky enough to have my grandparents, you know, the next building over. So my, you know, grandfather basically assumed that role and my mother, you know, pulled double duty. So it was, you know, I didn't miss much, which, which was pretty, pretty good. Wow. You know? And you, you know, as hard as it is, you know, you, you think that obviously you dodged a bullet in many ways, especially if he was that, right tabled yeah in his life. right and, and the funny thing um like his mother which my grandmother which i don't call her my grandmother um didn't want any any really didn't contact me at all which well really exactly the same thing yeah and my my, my dad was very successful he was a professor right. he was became a millionaire wow. um and and I heard later that he used to watch me on Days of Our Lives and brag to all his friends that I was his son. And then when he died, he left my sister and I each a dollar so that we couldn't contest the wheel. Well, because he had a lot of money. Right. And, uh, you know, and wow. just, just, you know, what a jerk. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, like I said, you, you've strived and, you know, you've got a great career and a great life. So that's, that's more important than anything. Absolutely. You know, and, and listen, everybody's got their story. You know, you, you and I are certainly not 
Yeah, we're not. Uh, by anyone in the minority here, you right. know, uh, everybody has got, and you know, it's it's how you deal with it. It's how you, you how you take something adverse, right. and you can either wallow and go down a different path. You just choose. I mean, we choose doors and paths to walk through, and yeah. fortunately, you know, we chose a positive path. Right. You know, because I know a lot of people who didn't. Of course, yeah, and I have three children, and they're like my world, so I know, which is great. So it's you know. I didn't learn how to be a father. I just became a father. So, which, you know, which, which is totally fine. So. Is your father, is he, is he, is he gone? Is he passed yeah. on? No, so. 15 years ago, I got a, I, I, some good came out of it. I got a letter from a first cousin who I never knew I had to let me know that he, he passed. He just wanted to let me know. So I became friendly with my first cousin. And he came back into my life, which, which was great. So I, I had that. So Our lives are so similar, by the way. It's exactly what happened to me, too. Wow. So, yeah. But, you know, it's, I didn't get screwed up, which is good. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm somewhat normal. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know we're, we're just old men wearing sleeve stack shirts. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, what, what, <laughs> yeah, play with dolls. I mean, you know. What, <laughs> I know, right? I got a ton of them back in my room, too. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really appreciate the time you've given me today, Wesley. I mean, this has been fantastic. Thanks. I, I, it's amazing people still want to talk about our about Land for Lost, and, and like you said, yeah. I'm just honored. Listen, I, I, this is not a day that goes by that I don't feel grateful right. for my life and for what I have, and and when I look around and my friends in the world and stuff like that. I mean, I am very lucky, and yeah. you know. I've got great friends and right. that, that's awesome because you know some <laughs> <laughs> but no it's true you know it's sometimes sometimes you feel like Pollyanna you feel you know right. and I I just I just feel very grateful I, yeah that's great because some people who have had like a successful show like you kind of you know take it for granted how successful the show was and just or I don't want to say ashamed but like you know are kind of like put off by it and like you know want to focus on other things that what then what made them famous it's know? so it's so ridiculous yeah. i i get so mad at celebrities right that play that card i think you know oh you know i don't want to talk about that so i go are you nuts that's why you're there you you know listen it's i know a lot of a lot of child stars of course it hasn't been an easy road for child stars child stars is horrible I remember I did the Sally Jesse show years ago, and I, I wasn't really a child star. I, I performed on theater in New York and stuff like that, but, but I was on my own the whole time. And everybody was on, and you know, from people that were committing suicide to been, there were a lot of incarcerations, there were all these child stars. And I was the last guest on. And the producers came, I'm standing back to go on through the fake door on Sally's set. And the producer said, Wesley, Wesley, this is the most depressing show we've ever done. You've got to make it funny. Right. I said, okay, okay, I'll make it funny. I'll make it funny. So the door opens, I come out, she goes, Sally goes, so Wesley, how are you? And I go, Sally, I can't even get arrested. <laughs> and she said, it took off from there. But you know, it's yeah. it's a rough road for a lot of people. I mean, uh, Kathy Coleman, who played my sister Holly, has written a book called Run, Holly, Run. And boy, it is, it's won, uh, won some amazing awards, literary awards. But it is a harrowing tale right. of her life after the show. Well, wow. you mentioned Todd Bridges before. I mean, all the stuff that he went through, you know, to come out of the other side, that's, that's fantastic. It's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, and what a great personality. It's so much fun. I mean, you, 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 you don't talk with Todd either. You listen to Todd. Yes. Right. So, uh, he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. That's great. That's great. But um, everyone, check out. Land of Lost, new TV, YouTube, DVDs, Dragon Tales. I think you can still watch it on PBS, right? Sometimes or no? I, you know, I, I don't know anymore. I haven't heard heard it on PBS. I, I sure wish it would come back. Right. Uh, but yeah, that's what YouTube is for. But uh, Wesley, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. I, I what? It's amazing. I see products from Land of the Lost right. that I never saw. <laughs> you know, from from like a periscope with our pictures on it. Yeah. You know, look over the fence, you know, right. toys and stuff like that. And that's one of the reasons Spencer left because he was trying to get merchandising from the cross and, and, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't budge on it. And he says, I'm gone. Right. 
w one more question because you brought it up. What was like the most unique piece of merchandise that you've seen with your like likeness on it? <clears throat> well, I, I, I'll tell you the most, I, the Viewmasters. Yeah. You know, to be part of a Viewmaster, I mean, because when I was a kid. Those are great. The, yeah, absolutely. The Viewmasters were like, yeah. They were so magical. They were 3D. And, you know, the little red one, you go click, and you right. see the next one's like, and yeah. the sudden you see your face on it. Right. As, sure. yeah. it's, you know, yeah. I, I'm amazed. I still, I just like, I, and people are still creating things. Like, I mean, Funko is now, you know, coming out with new products with, with Slee Stack and, and, and the Pakuni with Chaka yeah. and things like that. And even for the cross, for their star, they had gold ones. They made a gold Slee Stack and right. the Pakuni and stuff like that. And Phil Paley. Like Shaka, they made him buy his own. Are you serious? Yeah. So they're selling Funko's got this new thing. Philip goes to the, the star ceremony. There's right. a store selling him it's the, the, the exclusive version of these gold ones. Yeah. And he had to pay a hundred and something bucks to get his own character. That's ridiculous. Welcome, welcome to Hollywood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean they could have sold some and they could have did some agreement where he signed them and you know of course. Something. But no, that's, that's yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, but it, it's odd. I'll see photographs and stuff on the internet. I love the internet now because it's like, you, you, I, I see photos of myself that I've never seen before. Wow. I go, and, and behind the scenes photos, not just, not, not just stills yeah. from the show, but like, you know, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I put some on my Facebook the other day. In behind the scenes stuff with the director and directing the Pakuni and us laughing and giggling. And so, you know, it's great. But, um, Wesley, thank you so much. Uh, before we go, where can well, people find you? On uh, Facebook, Wesley Year. Uh, WesleyYear.com has more information than you'll ever need to know, but <laughs> Twitter and Instagram. So, awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much, and I appreciate it.